the Marketing Communications Manager here at Digium. And today on Astros Live, we are very pleased to have Joshua Culp. He is a senior software developer here at Digium who actually resides in New Brunswick, Canada, way up in the cold, bitter north. So welcome to Astros Live, Joshua. Thanks for having me. I'm also, I'm also joined today by... Pete Engler, he's our channel marketing manager, as well as our asterisk product marketing person. So Pete will be uh, asking Joshua some questions along with the lovely David Duffett. David Duffett, Hello. many of you probably know, he's uh, our worldwide asterisk community manager. So I'm going to turn it over to Pete Engler now to uh, get this interview started. All right, thank you, Julie. Hi, Josh. I know you've been involved with the uh, Asterisk development for quite a while, so let's just start out by having you tell us a little bit about your role and how long you've been at Digium. Uh, sure. So pretty much daily, I focus on making Asterisk better, uh, be that um, fixing issues that uh, people report through our issue tracker or looking forward um, pushing Asterisk into the future and improving it in big ways, like making big, substantial architectural changes. And really, um, I've been doing that for over nine years now. Um, before Digium, I just did that for people who basically wanted it. I was a consultant back then, um, and that was 12 years ago. And then nine years ago, I joined Digium. So I've been with Digium for quite a while now. I've seen it grow from 20 to 25 people all the way up to however many we have now since I've lost count, basically, um, the numerous, numerous people. But, um, yeah, I work with a great team that just makes Asterisk better every so, year. So, Josh, can I just jump in? Since you've been uh, with Digium uh, such a long time and were even working on Asterisk before you came to Digium, how did you actually hear of Asterisk in the very first place? Uh, everyone always asks me that question, and it's not an overly exciting answer I have to give. Um, I basically got my first laptop and installed Linux on it and started exploring that and through Google ended up finding Asterisk. And so I installed it, I made a call to the Digium PBX and went, hey, this is cool, I'm not using <laughs> my phone, I'm using my laptop and uh, started exploring the other stuff like voicemail, conferencing and uh, all that sort of stuff and uh, just sort of got hooked, started making changes, breaking stuff, uh, fixing stuff, and uh, going from there. And, and one more little one, if I may, uh, Pete, and that is, so uh, having got involved, uh, like doing the consulting for Asterisk, how did you get reeled, reeled into Digium? Um, I reeled myself in. <laughs> uh, I started making a name within the community, I guess. Uh, and then one day I sent a message to Kevin Fleming at the time saying, hey, are you hiring? It'd be nice to work for Digium. And he's like, yeah, sure, we'll hire you. And then like a day later, I'm suddenly working for Digium. Great. That's a good story. So we know that uh, you work remote, you work out of your house. So what is, your, what is a typical day like for you uh, working from home and working with the community? Um, so I try to start when everyone else is asleep <laughs> uh, because it's easier to get stuff done. So my time, I actually start at 8 a.m., which is 6 a.m. in Huntsville. So usually I'm online before anyone else, and uh, I just sort of start out by looking at anything that's happened on the mailing list, responding to community stuff, uh, as well as uh, looking at issues that have come in to see if there's any interesting ones that should be high priority. And then uh, I pretty much have an issue or something that I'm working on every day. And so I just pick that up and start going at it. And then as people arrive, both from the community and Digium, um, I start saying, hello, how are you? It's nice to see you again. <laughs> and uh, talking to them and just uh, establishing communication, just keeping that going back and forth. And then uh, every day at noon my time, uh, or 10 a.m. Huntsville time. Uh, we have, our team has a daily stand-up where we talk about what we've done, what we're going to be doing, any, any issues that have come up that we need help with, we need to discuss. 
And then uh, after that, it's back to working on the issue I have at the time until any meetings creep up or uh, until my day ends, which these days I usually try to end at about 5 p.m. my time or 3 p.m. Huntsville time. But um, if meetings come up, I just I just go with the flow, and if they come up afterwards, I just attend them anyway. So it's it, it's nice in the sense that I can get work done when nobody else is around, and my commits go in without any issue. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So I know being a technical guy, you probably have a lot of equipment there. Um, can you kind of give us a little idea of what you use on, you know, for your asterisk development, and uh, I know you have quite a few monitors sitting on your desk, so just real quick, curious about how, uh, what, what kind of setup you have there in your home. So this might surprise people, but um, uh, actually I'll save the surprise for uh, in a minute. Um, for an actual like work setup, um, I recently started investing in what I use daily, um, be it desk or chair or stuff, so um, for actual like physical um, desk office stuff, I have a um, electric standable desk. So um, about half of the day I'm standing like I am right now, uh, and then the other half I'm sitting down at my desk. Um, and then uh, for a chair, I've got an Aeron. I invested heavily in one. Uh, it's going to take many years to pay off, but it's a great chair. And then for computer hardware, I've actually got um, like you said three monitors. Uh, main one. I try to keep um, one for development stuff that I'm working on at the moment, one for my communication, so if I'm talking to Julie, like I do daily, um, <laughs> over there. And then the other one I actually keep um, for uh, email and stuff and notes. Uh, and then for an actual computer, I just have a normal uh, IBM Lenovo desktop, and then on my desk I have a nice Digium D70, uh, be sure to buy D70s. They're awesome. <laughs> and nice then, product uh, placement. Yeah. I'm good with product placement. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then I actually have a mechanical keyboard, which um, if anyone has an experience in mechanical keyboard, uh, pretty much once you go for a mechanical one, you can never go back to other keyboards because they just feel a lot better and you generally type faster on them. The con is they are quite, quite noisy. Um, but I like it. And then the slight surprise is I run Windows for my desktop and my laptop and stuff. Um, I'm not running Linux on here. And I just like it to work generally. But for actual asterisk development, I use uh, virtual machines. So I develop in an Ubuntu regular server virtual machine, and uh, I use Sublime Text for a text editor. So it's... Uh, it's a slight surprise that I use Windows, but it works and lets me work on Asterisk more, since I don't have to worry about Linux stuff. It's definitely a slight surprise, Josh. I'm um, shocked. Now, <laughs> down in the bottom of the screen there, there's a picture of you, and you're pictured wearing a hat, which you sometimes do at Astricon. So tell us about your experiences at Astricon and how you came to wear a hat there. Um, yeah, the hat thing. I don't know why I got into hats, to be honest. I just started collecting them, white hats. Don't know why. Um, and so I make it a point at Astrocon to just wear whatever I fancy for a hat, be it a bowler or a top hat or, uh, or other stuff. But it's a nice way to, uh, to differentiate yourself from everyone else and draw attention, um, which is nice in regards that it makes people approach you and talk and say, hey, you're wearing an interesting hat. Um, who are you? Um, and that usually leads to more conversations about asterisk and that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, Astrocon, Astrocon is great. You've been now. Did you go to the first one, or did you come in um, on the second or third, Josh? I have been to every Astrocon except two of them: the first one and then another one, which I can't remember because they all sort of blur together. Right. And how, how have you? You've been coming a long time. How have you seen things? change over the years? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, we've gotten, from a developer perspective, Astro DevCon has changed in that we've sort of continued to tweak how we do it, um, how we approach it, how our schedule goes, and that sort of thing. 
as well, the attendance for Astrocon or Astro DevCon has um, increased and gone up, which is awesome since we get uh, more feedback. Uh, as well, recently I've started uh, streaming it for those who can't actually be in attendance. Uh, so the first year uh, that I started streaming, it was only available via a um, a link that you had to put into a uh, a uh, a music player like VLC. Uh, as well, um, for the uh, for the second year, uh, I've started or I started past tense. Uh, streaming it via web page. And the cool thing about that is, thanks to the features that went into Asterisk 13, I was actually able to stream it directly from Asterisk out to uh, everyone who wanted to listen in that manner. Um, I didn't need like extra software or anything. Uh, in the past, that would have been required, but these days, it's, uh, it's not as much. And uh, I actually have a blog post, uh, another, uh, another- Nice blog. <laughs> Uh, another, another good place to get some information on uh, joshua-cult.com, which actually details how that's done using Asterisk 13 and uh, includes the configurations. So if anyone's interested, uh, you can check it out there. So, Josh, you mentioned Asterisk 13. Is there anything um, that people may not be aware of that's in Asterisk 13 that they should be aware of? Uh, well, the, stre features? the streaming thing, for one. Um, I don't think anybody's really noticed that that's in there. Um, uh, other stuff that people don't know about when it comes to Asterisk 13. Um, everyone already should know, if you don't, know about PJSEP. Uh, that's a personal favorite since I was one of the people that wrote it. Um, ARI, of course. Uh, but from a not just what's in it, but from a policy perspective, Asterisk 13 is going to change as it continues to get developed because unlike previous versions, we're actually adding new features to it in every release. Um, so we actually have a policy for that. So if in the past someone has downloaded Asterisk 13.0, it's not the same as Asterisk 13.1 from a features perspective. So um, it's sort of it's constantly changing now, and new features are being added. Um, other interesting stuff. Uh, unfortunately, nothing immediately springs to mind. Yeah. Uh, I do have a recommendation, though, for people who do want to discover that sort of stuff. We publish, with, with each release, a change log um, saying what's changed, both from actual commits and also from a high-level perspective. Um, so if you're interested in seeing what's changed between 13.0 to 13.1, definitely check that out. Perfect. So is there anything that you can think about or, or tell people that may be under the hood of Asterisk that they may not realize but rely on quite a bit? Um, one of the things that I did for Asterisk 12 and thus Asterisk 13 was for PJSIP and stuff going forward was to completely change how configuration is done. And configuration is generally something that people just use and don't realize that it's sort of something has to be there to read it in and use it, um, but they just sort of configure something and, hey, it magically works. So in previous, uh, in previous modules for Asterisk, uh, there was no cohesive framework for doing configuration across databases or configuration files um, and for doing it safely uh, for developers. So uh, each person who used it had to write their own thing for handling. If you type reload, hey, I want to take this new configuration file in and make it effective. If you wrote a module, you had to do your own logic for doing that. And really, that's not sustainable, and it also suffers from bugs. So I wrote some under the hood stuff, which nobody from a user perspective would actually notice, um, which uh, provides a framework for doing that, and it also provides some guarantees. So for example, if you do a reload and you put in a bad configuration for PJSIP, it's not going to let you apply it. It just won't. It won't allow you to. Even if you try to force it, it won't allow it. And it'll tell you why. So you can't, you can't make a mistake as much as you could in the past. Um, I think uh, we can see that configuration style 
that you've implemented in PJSIP and also in confbridge.conf. What other files does it show up in, Josh? Uh, so the sorcery stuff, which is the framework which links it all together, is currently only applicable to uh, PJSIP, unless someone has used it elsewhere, but I don't think it has been used yet. Um, there was another attempt which did not encompass databases as well, which databases are still a huge thing for people, um, which was used in ConfBridge and some other modules, but uh. not that um, One of the other nice things from a uh, developer perspective is that if you do a reload, it's guaranteed to work or fail. And then from a user perspective, um, the underlying framework also provides mechanisms to uh, make CLI and uh, uh, Asterisk Manager stuff easier. Uh, in the past, if you added a new option, you, all, you also had to update the CLI command and the Asterisk Manager interface to list that if someone wanted to get information about something. With the new framework, that's taken care of automatically. So uh, if a developer forgets, it doesn't matter because it'll still be there. Uh, so that's one of the under-the-hood things that uh, that people don't realize is there, but uh, take advantage of and use quite a lot. Great. So if somebody wanted to go get more information or talk to other developers, where's a great place or resource for them to, to do that? Uh, so for someone who is wanting to write applications on top of Asterisk, so someone who is using the Asterisk Manager interface or the new Asterisk REST interface. Uh, we have a new mailing list which uh, came into existence about uh, a little over a year ago called the Asterisk App Dev mailing list. Um, and that's different to the uh, other places because uh, it's focused on building applications using Asterisk. And uh, if you're a person looking to go down that area instead of working on Asterisk directly, um, it's a great place to post uh, information or request for information yourself uh, because there's a lot of people on there who have done the same sort of stuff and have found the good ways and the bad ways of doing it. If you're looking to extend Asterisk or actually contribute, uh, the mailing list is great, the Asterisk-dev mailing list. Um, you can post whatever you want related to Asterisk development on there and people will respond. We also have an Asterisk Dev uh, IRC channel on Freenode, uh, which is live. But uh, if you go on there, do take into account time zones. Uh, not everyone will be in your time zone. Some are in Europe. Uh, a good portion of people are in North America. So if you don't get a response immediately, just stick around, and uh, hopefully someone will respond. Uh, as well, if you're looking to contribute to Asterisk, uh, my, my opinions on that is, don't look at the project first before uh, contributing. Look at how our coding guidelines to make sure that the style you submit is uh, actually good according to us. Because if it isn't, we're going to say, hey, this doesn't fit in. Um, can you please change it? So that will save you some time there. As well, talk about what you're actually going to uh, work on in the Asterisk Dev mailing list. Uh, get a feel for it before you start, because if you start working on things and it turns out it's not a great direction, then uh, then when you try to submit it back, it's uh, we're going to say that, and it may have been some wasted time there. So I really suggest uh, talking before you start doing. Uh, as well, when you do get to uh, the point where you want to like submit back to Asterisk, uh, there's a guide on the wiki at wiki.asterisk.org which details the process you can go through. And uh, as well these days, we do code reviews on pretty much everything that goes into Asterisk to ensure that, um, that, nothing, that, that nothing evidently bad gets in uh, that could harm the system. And we should really highlight that uh, wiki.asterisk.org because it's a, a source of great things in many different domains, not least uh, Asterisk user documentation and examples of implementations and all kind of stuff. Uh, in fact, uh, when I've been experimenting with Asterisk and WebRTC myself and I've asked Josh questions, he's very graciously pointed me in the direction of the wiki where all the answers lay. Um, we were talking to Rusty just the other day, uh, Josh, on uh, Asterisk Live, 
and uh, I asked the question, what's your favourite thing about Asterisk? And I think I should ask you that very same question. Joshua Culp, what is your favourite thing about Asterisk? Uh, my favourite thing at this point in time is the new Asterisk REST interface on the basis of the power it gives people who would not traditionally be Asterisk developers to develop great applications on top of Asterisk. And while it's been fundamentally different, it's really a different way of thinking about things. There's a lot of power there that, if you realize is there, is extremely powerful. Um, for example, one of the things I did that I don't, I know a few people are using it, but I don't, I don't know how many, I don't think people realize how powerful it is, is the spying and whispering mechanisms in the Asterisk REST interface which is basically spy or whisper to this call, and the act of doing that creates a new channel which you can send anywhere. So, for example, if you want to, like, spy on a call and record it, you can say spy on this call and then send that resulting channel to record or to playback, to, like, playback audio to a supervisor, like a beep or something. Um, and I don't think that's something that's really been exercised yet, but I think it's extremely, uh, extremely, uh, uh, extremely powerful uh, in what you can do with it and how you connect media and stuff together. So um, if more people could use that, that'd be great. Peter, David, do you guys have any other questions for Joshua? I think I'm pretty all wrapped up, thank you. Just uh, one final question for you. Um, what do you like to do outside of work? Hobbies? <laughs> um, so in my spare time, I do IT work on the side um, for a nice co-working space downtown. So I get to rapidly hit a printer every few weeks and hope it breaks. Um, as well, I like movies. I read a lot, both um, sci-fi novel stuff as well as industry stuff, um, seeing what's on the horizon for, uh, for technology. Um, so, yeah, I just like to continue to uh, advance my knowledge of stuff. And Joshua is a dog lover, so he spends some time with his beautiful dog, Miss Zoe. Yes. I have to give her a shout-out. Some would say she is not my dog. She is someone else living here. <laughs> she is not your your dog, Josh, but you are her person. Yeah, yeah. That would be a good way of saying it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Hey, Josh, I was going to ask you, you know, if you're in the forums, if someone would want to uh, contact you, do they see you as Joshua Cole, or do you go by another code name? We, so, we can't talk about Miss Julie. It's private and secret. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so, I'm different things in different places, depending on where you look. Intriguing. So, hmm? Very intriguing. Uh, it's history. Um, in commits, I'm known as file. On the asterisk issue tracker, you can find me as Jake Cole. On Twitter, you can find me as JoshNet. Um, as well, I run the asterisk dev Twitter account which um, I tweet interesting asterisk development-related stuff, as well as if we do releases, then they'll also be announced on there. Um, so, And then on IRC, I'm also known as File, just because I've been known as File for 15 years. Very good. Very good. Well, thank you so much, David and Pete. And Joshua, this has been so much fun. Thank you for joining us, and uh, we look forward to... Uh, Seeing everyone back for the next edition of Astros Live. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.